Howdy again, everybody. This is Doc from Thoroughfan coming to you with another fun educational segment. And of course, one of the big things that has really been in the news of late has been uh, the increased incidence of breakdowns happening at Keeneland, uh, happening up in New York. And of course, everybody's been following what's been going on out in California. And uh, obviously, every breakdown now is kind of getting a little bit more scrutinized, especially the, the catastrophic or the fatal breakdowns. But what we really wanted to do here was kind of give you a little bit of education as to exactly what the industry means and what the veterinary profession means when we actually use the term breakdown. Uh, some people really don't understand quite what it means or what exactly is happening in the horse and uh, we are going to try to explain that all exactly why it does seem to happen, what are some of the consequences and why a lot of times they do turn into fatal catastrophic injuries that can't be saved as we once again look at our next health segment as Doc discusses breakdowns. So when we're looking at catastrophic injuries in racehorses, the most common type that we do run across is uh, disarticulation and fractures that are involving the fetlock joint. And most commonly this occurs in the front limbs of racehorses. And the fetlock joint basically is outlined by the separation between my forefinger and thumb here on this horse legs model. So it happens just about, you know, from about the bottom third of the cannon bone, also known as the third metacarpal, uh, through that joint and down into the first phalanx. So this whole area here is what we're most concerned with. A lot of people equate it to the, the ankle um, in humans. And uh, this is the whole problem area that we run into a lot of times with these catastrophic injuries. So what is a breakdown of the fetlock joint and why is it prone to breakdown? What exactly happens? Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. And in order to do that, we've got to spin things around and see exactly what's going on with the bones. All right, so here we are with a little bit more of a close-up view of our fetlock joint here. And the first thing I'm gonna point out is uh, what we've got kind of making up the joint in general. So you've got the cannon bone, or the third metacarpal coming down here. Uh, you've got, as we shift things around here a little bit, you've got two sesamoid bones, one that you can see here, and you've got the joint area space itself, and you've got the first phalanx here. Now, you do also have a section of this cannon bone called the condyle. And a lot of people in racing will hear this horse suffered a condylar fracture. And what happens in those cases, these are not always catastrophic or fatal, but I did want to bring this up now because it is probably a little bit of a point of confusion since you're dealing with the fetlock joint and what's going on in there and uh, all together. As you can see in the uh, x-rays that uh, are on your screen right now, a lot of times you will get um, these types of uh, linear fractures that go right through one condyle or the other condyle. And while they can be catastrophic and unfortunately can lead to euthanasia in certain cases, uh, a lot of times they're not. Uh, we actually can go in, as you can see um, with uh, the pictures of these radiographs here, and put a couple of screws in to just seal up that fracture. The horse gets some time off, recovers, uh, and with proper care, and if there's no complications, they go on to do great without any problems. When we're talking about the fetlock joint and everything that can go wrong with it though, especially in racing, the bigger issue involves the whole joint and something known as the suspensory apparatus. And there is a ligament that runs, starts kind of up at the cannon bone here, runs down across and kind of attaches down to the sesamoid here. And uh, there's a little accessory branch that kind of runs uh, you know, around and across to add a little more stability. And this whole ligament is basically responsible for helping to keep the horse with their leg in the proper position as we can see here. Now, under the heavy stresses of racing, uh, especially towards the later parts of a race, as the horse is hitting there, because you have to remember, uh, horses will put all of their weight and force on each leg. They, you know, they don't have two legs when they're at a full racing gallop, uh, usually on the track at the same time. It's uh, four different legs hitting the ground at different times. And so this whole uh, joint will actually flex downward. Uh, you know, or extend downward, I guess I should say, is a better way of describing it. And as you can see in the picture here, as well as in this video that was a wonderful video shot back a long time ago by the Jockey Club, but really demonstrates things really well, um, you can see how much that fetlock then drops. And this is where we get really concerned because 
that suspensory ligament and apparatus can only take so much. It is designed to absorb a lot of that shock and then help the legs spring back when they come back up off the, the dirt or the turf. But uh, if you overtax the system, and usually this is why you see these things happen in a later time frame of a race, usually uh, the final turn or in the stretch or things like that, it's because you put so much force and put so much overtaxing on that suspensory area that it just shreds. It, it, it comes apart and that can lead to a couple of things where you actually then have fractures. It starts to pull apart the, uh, the sesamoid bones, if, especially if they're weak, um, and it can lead to a complete disarticulation of the entire fetlock joint, which uh, basically would be us severely, severely dislocating our ankle uh, would be the equivalent. So that is where you get into catastrophic problems, and that is where, unfortunately, a lot of these horses cannot be saved because you just have so much damage that is done in there uh, to that suspensory apparatus. Another area, obviously, that can lead to catastrophic uh, uh, you know, breakdowns or, or failures, and we do see this from time to time, are severe fractures of the cannon bone itself, where the cannon bone just sort of shatters, uh, where you do get fractures through P1 at times, and uh, other fractures that can involve certain areas in the back part of the cannon bone as well. But it really is the, the destruction of that entire suspensory apparatus that we talk about when we are talking about breakdowns, because basically that's what happens, is the whole joint breaks down. So why is that such a problem in horses and, and why can't we basically just go in and, and, and fix it? So why are a lot of these breakdowns that we see in these suspensory breakdowns and the, and the fetlock disarticulations, why are they fatal so many times and, and the horse cannot be saved? Well. Obviously, you're taking away the whole support apparatus of that leg, uh, and horses can't survive on three legs, unfortunately, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But the bigger issue a lot of times is blood supply. When you have major catastrophic injuries going on in here, uh, you disrupt a lot of the blood vessels and blood supply that comes down to that section as well as everything below it. So uh, the major areas of the hoof and, and other ligaments, muscles, tendons, all of that. You can't have healing without proper blood supply. And despite the major advances that have been made in veterinary medicine, we really have not found a way to properly restore the blood flow to those areas once it's been totally disrupted. And unfortunately, in those cases, a lot of times the only thing you can do is humanely euthanize the horse. So that brings up the question of, well, if this happens in people, and even in dogs and cats, where you get these really bad fractures and injuries, if the leg can't be saved, you can still amputate it. Why can't you do that in horses? Why wouldn't that work? Now, if you or I were to severely twist our ankle, uh, dislocate our ankle, or even break our ankle, uh, chances are we'd be spending a lot of time just like this, sitting down with our leg up, uh, potentially in a cast, in an air cast, in a splint. Uh, we might be in a wheelchair for a while, depending on the nature of the injury. We might be uh, on crutches all the time. So, of course, the question is asked, why can't we do that with horses? Why can't we kind of lay up horses the same way? And unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to work that way. Uh, horses are meant to be on four legs, and despite a lot of our best efforts, and yes, there are the occasional stories out there of a horse that does well with an artificial limb or, or part of a limb or does okay on, on, on mostly three legs, it, that's really the exception, not the rule. Unfortunately, one of the biggest things we worry about in, in these cases is a life-threatening condition known as laminitis, and we have talked about it before, where when obviously, as in a human, what are we doing? We're keeping weight off this leg because we want things to heal right. If we were forced to walk around on a dislocated ankle all the time, it never would heal. And the same thing would be the problem in horses, even with surgery. Um, the biggest problem we have is the fact that those other three legs then take on a greater load than they were designed to. And for some reason, and again, reasons we don't completely understand, uh, that makes that what we call the contralateral limb, uh, much more prone to developing laminitis. And then that creates a, a whole problem because the laminitis can hit one foot, it can hit all four feet, it can hit two feet, and then the horse really doesn't have a leg to stand on. Now they have made some strides with special slings that they've been able to put horses in, and, and anybody who remembers the Barbaro incident, uh, you know, over a decade ago now, um, that's one of the things they did use for him at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the New Bolton Center, is they did use a sling to try to help support him a little bit, and you're seeing some pictures of that now, as well as uh, how the slings work. A couple of things with that. You can't keep a horse in a sling like that long term uh, for a lot of different reasons, and not every horse is going to tolerate it very well. Sometimes you have to keep them very heavily sedated 
in order to allow the, a sling like that to work. It's very labor intensive, it's very costly, and it's not always guaranteed to work. Um, you just really need to have horses being able to stand on all four limbs uh, because otherwise they, they more than likely are just not gonna be able to survive. So while we would like to you know, look more into things like amputations that sometimes are done on dogs and cats, uh, and especially humans if they have a really severe injury, uh, you just can't do it with horses. We just have not found a way to make it work yet. So unfortunately, until we get that medical breakthrough um, we cannot lay up horses the same way we do dogs cats and people so I hope that kind of just helps explain a little bit. I know it's it's a very difficult concept to try to grasp. I, uh, trust me, I still had to look a lot of stuff up, uh, considering I work mostly on dogs and cats as a veterinarian, to completely understand the apparatus and talk to a couple of equine vet friends of mine just to completely understand what's going on with the breakdowns there. But I hope it does kind of give a little bit of information to you guys as far as what exactly is happening with a breakdown and, and why they are fatal in a lot of cases and why, unfortunately, despite all of the advances in modern medicine, and veterinary medicine, we still can't save a lot of these horses. And it's, as I said, it's it's not a topic that anybody really likes to talk about, but at Thorofan, we really do believe that everybody should be educated. So we hope that this did provide some uh, proper education for everybody. And, uh, you know, going forward, we will be also doing some segments on what some predisposing issues to these breakdowns may be. I didn't want to get into that on this segment because we didn't want to kind of bias anything. We just want to give the exact information as to what it is so that you, the racing fan, are as educated as you can be. I am Doc for Thoroughfan, and if anything new and interesting is happening in the world of racing, or if you just want to learn more about this amazing sport, there's only one spot that you need to go to, and that is Thoroughfan.